So we did the video the day before yesterday about Dave Benjamin's hydraulic explosion. And I try to avoid nitro topics because it's a sickness. I have the sickness. It's like having, it's like having an alcoholic hanging out in a bar. You just you don't want to do that. It's not a good deal. So when I quit, when I quit, I literally gave things away. Like I sold a car, I sold a motor, and then I gave away, I can't tell you how many blocks, heads, cranks, pistons, rods, blowers. Just here, take this stuff, get it out of here, right? The only things that didn't, I didn't get rid of, and it wasn't on purpose, breather mask and my hydrometer, right? That, that was it. Now, why didn't I get rid of these things? I couldn't find them. When I went on that frenzy to, like, just clear everything out, these things were like, I, they were in a closet someplace. And uh, I just didn't know where they were. So, afterwards, like a year or two afterwards, uh, I found them and it's like, okay, well, keepsakes, right? But a lot of you guys expressed interest in Nitro. So, I don't want to get too crazy, like, direction, channel, talking about a lot of Nitro stuff, but there were a couple of incidents that, that are technically interesting, that, that are kind of relatable, and they have to do with the learning curve and the, and the characteristics of fuel. And, like I said, it applies. It, it kind of applies to different, different disciplines. The learning curve is painful, but that learning curve is what I was addicted to. I could, like I said, I've never been a speed guy. I could kill this about speed. The noise and, and, and the violence of the cars was cool, no question about it, but I was addicted to the technology. So, during my time doing it, a dozen years or so, 12, 13 years, I bounced from car to car to car to car to car. And I had my hands on every type of fuel car that there was. Big show fuel dragsters, big show funny cars, nostalgia top fuel cars, nostalgia funny cars, and fuel alters. And the fuel alter was always my favorite. And why did I like the fuel altered so much? Because it didn't fit any, it didn't fit any mold. It didn't have any of the characteristics of the other cars. It was kind of all on its own. And it was such a wild card. So, like, you, if you ran a, a, a big show funny car, you could expect it to run a certain, it was a certain technology. And it fit that profile. And so it was kind of formulaic. And then if you ran a nostalgia top fuel car, very formulaic. But the altered was a mixed bag. It was everywhere because it didn't have the aerodynamics of the funny car. It didn't have the didn't have any of the things that made the other cars predictable. Right? They were all over the map. So that's that's what attracted me to them. So you talk about the learning curve. One of the basic characteristics of nitro is that it's load sensitive, meaning that it'll burn as much fuel as the load requires. If you take the load away, it goes fat. It'll drop cylinders. And it'll keep dropping cylinders until the load is met. So, for instance, let's just say, and this, uh, this is leading up to this example, you take a, a big show funny car motor, and now we're talking about, now, I'm not talking about contemporary stuff, I've been out of this since the 90s, so I have no idea what they're doing out there today. But going back to the 1990s, you take a big show funny car motor, something that runs 570, 550, which was, which was kind of middle of the pack at that point. Dual pump, dual mag, uh, 1471 blower, and of course the clutch that goes with it. And it's predictable. Now, you take that same exact combination and you put it in a fuel altered, which doesn't have the aerodynamic advantage of the body. And now, it'll just drop cylinders. Now, the aerodynamics, when we think of aerodynamics, generally speaking, we think of the ability to cut through the wind. So, the more aerodynamic a car is, the less power it takes to push it through. But nitro is the exact opposite. Nitro, the aerodynamics, are there to create load or resistance and keep the motor running. One of the historic um, examples of this was, the, was Garlitz's Jocko liner, 1973, where they still, at that period of time, the knowledge wasn't really there. Uh, the, the load sensitive or, or the, the, uh, um, the requirement of load to keep the fuel burned 
wasn't there. They weren't putting enough volume of fuel through the engines for that to really become a factor yet. So they still didn't really understand that. There were differences in the tune-up between a funny car and a dragster, but the science wasn't there. So Garlitz has Jocko, a fabricator. He built a, a couple of land speed bodies, land speed cars. He has him build a body for his dragster, a short wheelbase version of his dragster. And this thing is slippery as hell. And you can see it, it's in the Garlitz Museum now. Slippery, beautiful thing. It's just, it's, a, it's like a, a piece of nature. It's just like, you know, formed by the forces of nature, that kind of thing, right? They put this on the car, it won't run for anything. Same car, same dragster, but now they took away the resistance of the non aerodynamic dragster and its wings and they put it in a super slippery, super swoopy body and it didn't push enough wind to burn the fuel. And so once it got halfway down the track, it would start to lay down. It would drop cylinders. It didn't, it didn't make any power. At the time, it was, it was uh, chalked up to weight. They weighed too much. But it didn't weigh any more than a typical funny car body of the day and funny cars were going faster than that. So it was a matter of it was a matter of the learning curve. The knowledge wasn't there yet. So, the load sensitive nature of nitro. I worked with one guy, I'm not gonna, I'm, I don't wanna mention his name. I worked with one guy and he had a, a funny car and decided to put an altered body on it. So, the car was running consistently as a funny car. It wasn't really hurting itself. It was, it was doing what it was supposed to do. It was running like 560s at the time. 560s, 550s. Which again, was like middle of the road, middle of the pack. Now, when you take that combination, that exact combination that works in a funny car, and you take the body away and you put this little T-bucket on it, well, all of a sudden, that aerodynamic drag is gone, right? Because the funny car body is shaped like a wing. It's, it's adding downforce and resistance, and it's helping to burn the fuel as the car goes down the track. So, I'm working with this guy, and we take the car out as an altered, and we run a couple of match races in the Midwest with it. And this thing wouldn't run, it was, it was just a slug, okay? It was just a slug. No difference at all, except that we took the funny car body away and put the altered body on it. And it was obvious at that point that it was just, there wasn't enough drag, there wasn't enough load to keep the motor happy. So, we run a couple of match races with this thing and it's like running like, like 680s, 70s, it's just, it's, run, it's, it's running through on five cylinders. It starts out, it hits on eight, and then, you know, by, by the eighth mile, it's dropped two cylinders. And then by the quarter, it's, I guess, it's running on like five or four cylinders. It's just not happy. So I says, you know what? Let's build a combination that's representative of pre-aerodynamic nitro racing. Let's build, let's set this thing up as if it's 1971, 1972, and it's a dragster. Okay? So... I go about putting a, a combination together, and it was really it was, it was crude. It was all leftover parts. It was it was just just junk. Nobody wanted it at the time. It was all very outdated stuff. So, it was a, a 44. It was a half inch stroke motor. Uh, it had old KB block. It was like KB block, like number like 187. It was like this super early block. And we had a set of dark water heads. And the dark water heads are essentially aluminum versions of the cast iron Chrysler heads. These are like the earliest ones. And we put an 871 on top of this thing. Instead of a 1471, we put an 871 on top of this thing. And it was an old 871. So it was just like, you just grab the snout of this thing and give it a spin. Right? And we just keep going, right? It was toast. But for this purpose, it may work. So put a, 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 an Enderly 1100 pump on it. Run straight up. Okay? No overdrive to the pump. And we stick this thing in the car. Old Mallory Super Mag 3. So we stick this thing in the car and we go take it to a match race and right off the bat, car runs right through. It goes like 6.30, 6.35, whatever it was. Clean as a whistle, smooth, perfect, beautiful, nice flames in a little bit. I'm like, okay, we're on to something here. Let's go back, uh, make another run with the car, made a couple of adjustments and it goes like 6.20. And it's like, 
this is really good. Clean, perfect. Take the plugs out. Look, the plugs, the plugs are perfect. The, everything is just exactly the way it's supposed to be. It's like a bracket car, right? Like nothing to do with this thing between rounds except change the oil and run the, the valves. Do a couple of changes to it. Go out, make another run. 602. 602. Which now remember now, put this, in, put this in perspective. This is 30 years ago. This is a double A fuel altered. 602 was, I mean, rocking. That would have put you right in the thick of things. I think the quickest car in the world at the time was running like 570s. Fuel altered. So this is awesome. Okay, we can keep whittling away at this and, and messing with it and, and we'll eventually go, we'll get it into fives. It's right there. It's right there. Okay. So now I go off and I get a hired gig working on somebody's, somebody's big show top fuel car for a race or two. And then I did something with my own car. And then, so a couple of months go by before I, I have any contact with this guy. So he calls me up. He says, okay, we got a match race in New Jersey. He says, can you make it? I says, yeah, I'll be there for sure. So I show up at the match race, right? He's already there. He's got the car set up. It's, it's already it's ready. To, actually, he's just ready to warm up. Just, they're just waiting for me. So I get there, and as I'm pulling up on the pit, I see a giant pink wing standing up out of the... And I'm like, what the hell is that, right? Okay, so this fella had went and bought a wing from Shirley Muldowney. And this was, this was right off of her top, it was like a spare, off of their top fuel car. I paid top dollar for it. It was the contemporary wing. I don't remember the details of the wing, but it was like what was being run in 1992, 1993. State-of-the-art stuff. And I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, where'd you get that thing? He says, ah, oh, I needed a wing. I know what needed a wing, so we've got to put a wing on it. All these other cars running wings. And he says, but the car isn't set up to run a wing. The car is set up to run like an old slingshot dragster. You know, the wing, it's not going to... He says, oh, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I says, but the load. He says, oh, don't worry about it. I says, fine. So we go about the whole process. We warm the car up. Car sounds awesome on the jack stands. Put it on the ground. And now we go around to make our run. And usually I stay behind the starting line. But this time I wanted to see what this car looked and sounded like from down the track a little bit. So get the car started. And I start walking down track while he does the burnout. And I get to about 300 feet out. So I says, all right, I'll hang out here and I'll watch from here. So car, car goes by doing a burnout. Sounds killer. It's just awesome. It's hitting on all eight. I'm like, should be pretty cool. So I'm standing there and he backs the car up, stages the car. Tree comes down. Car leaves like an animal. It's like, bah! right? It's right there. And it gets about 70, 80, 100 feet out. And I see smoke starting to come out the pipes. And now it's coming past me. As it's coming past me now, I see smoke on both banks. And the mortar's getting quieter. And it gets to about the eighth mile mark. And this thing is just blowing white smoke. Just, and it's getting quieter and quieter. And finally, it got to about 900 feet, 1,000 feet. And it was just silent. So this thing was just, it, just, it literally just faded away as it went down the track and coasted through the lights. So <laughs> what the hell is that? I knew what happened, right? It melted every, and that's exactly what happened. It melted every single piston in the engine. The wing, it couldn't handle the load. The motor was set up to run just, you know, no aerodynamics, no nothing, just a bikini body and a small body and, and go. You add this wing with all of that drag, and that's it. It was just total meltdown. Now, hindsight would have been put the wing on it and then put the funny car motor back in the thing. But, you know, you, you got to do this stuff as you go along. And uh, I think that was it. I, I don't think he ran fuel altered after that. That was like the last hurrah for that car. No, it, was a, it was a very painful, very, very intricate learning curve. And I don't even like to talk about this stuff because my urge now is to just like say, buy YouTube, buy street cars, buy all this stuff. I'm going to go, I'm going to go nitro. No, I, I don't want to talk about it anymore. So we're just, we're just going to leave it. At, yeah, no more nitro stuff for a while. But uh, yeah, you guys, you guys that want nitro stories, well, there's a nitro story. And, and there's a basics, one of the basic fundamentals of how this stuff works. It's all load sensitive. Every car is different. Every type of car is different. It's so exacting. And that's the addictive part, right? That's, that's the needle. That's the sickness. I'll see you tomorrow.